This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. Hi, I'm Walt Grayson. You can now listen to the wild, weird, and wonderful stories of Mississippi with Mile Marker. Some of the big names that travel up and down the highways, obviously Elvis and Johnny Cash, and you have Jerry Lewis, Carl Perkins. Join me as we hit the roads of Mississippi on Mile Marker. Johnny Cash suggested that Carl write a song called Blue Suede Shoes. That was all kind of created with Aaron Amory. You can listen by going to mpbonline.org slash radio or by using your favorite podcasting app. You're listening to Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. It's the show all about your animals and the animals around you. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. On today's show, we'll welcome Dr. Frank Moore, distinguished professor emeritus at the University of Southern Mississippi. For more than 30 years, he, his students, and other collaborators have studied the biology of migratory songbirds across North America, but more intensely along the northern coast of the Gulf of Mexico. So today we'll talk about these migratory birds that visit Mississippi along their migration. Dr. Major's here, always ready for pet questions. Libby likes to talk about your recent encounters with nature. You can email animals at mpbonline.org. If you miss Creature Comforts on Thursday, it repeats Saturday mornings at 6. So good morning, Libby. Let's uh, start out with you. What uh, what have you been seeing in and around your yard lately? Oh, wow. It's it's kind of like... This time of year, every time I go out, I'm thinking, oh, that's the first time I've seen that for a while. And, oh, that's the first time. Saw red-spotted purple yesterday, butterfly, which are one of my favorite butterflies. And I had to look a couple of times to be positive. And then, sure enough, he slowed down so that I could get a look. And it looked like a brand-new, fresh, newly emerged, just perfect condition red spotted purple so uh, just a reminder this is you don't want to miss spring so get outside in spite of the pollen and I'm saying pollen's getting better I don't know if the authorities are saying that yet or not but it seems like I, it wasn't as, as bothersome yesterday I didn't take my allergy pill this morning but uh, great things going on outside um, I think I've mentioned the spiders were getting started these few um, cold nights have kicked us back a little and then I think on into the next week we're going to have some cold weather so that might slow down the invertebrates a little bit but um Let's see. As far as my yard, I'm still watching this. What I'm saying, Frank, you may have to tell me more about it, but um, Phoebe working on the nest, not singing at all. So I'm taking that to be the female that's back. And that sounds right. I don't know a way to, to tell the difference between them other than that. But um, she... She's got the nest just in beautiful condition. She's even used some of her own feathers in it, it looks like. And I've got a great view for it, but still no male. What about Carolina wrens? So I'm worried. Uh, Yes, I've got Carolina wrens. And now they acted like they were about to nest um, until this cold weather. So I'm not sure. I've got two tufted tip mice nests going in boxes that had always been bluebirds. Mm. But my bluebird population has really seemed to plummet the last few years. And um, I, I blame that really cold winter for a long time because I found dead bluebirds in those boxes. Mm. So that may be it. But I'm happy to have at least somebody living in those boxes. And I've got chickadees that um, act like they're nesting, but I haven't found either which boxes we've we've scattered so many nest boxes through the years that they're in all kinds of shape of repair and there's probably 30 nesting boxes somewhere or another around our place does your does your property landscape allow for purple martins or it would be kind of iffy i think we've got a pond and the the driveway goes right by the pond and that's open area Mm -hmm. so on the edge of the driveway but we've planted trees in all that area and we lost a tree oh gosh almost seven years ago because it was close to my grandson's birth when we lost the big oak in that area so that oak is gone and it looked like, oh, well, we might do Purple Martins. But then other trees, of course, are filling in now. Mm-hmm. So I'm, it would be iffy, I think, to try Purple Martins. I thought about it this year, and maybe next year we should. We're probably on the tail end now, huh? Because it sounds like they're starting to show up. Yeah, I would think they're a pretty early migrant. Yeah. And, uh, 
Yeah, but our, our our property on the south side was uh, logged recently, uh, cleared, and so in some sense, if those indiv- if those folks wanted to do something with Purple Martins, it might be a decent place. Although there's and there's a lake nearby, so we'll see. Could you do a Purple Martin house on your edge of that property that, that's uh, close may, to Maybe. Them? That might work. Um, but I haven't seen any around. So this is fairly recent uh, clearing. Yeah, that would be a fun thing to do. We're going to talk about Purple Martins with, um, oh, I can't say right now who agreed to come, but it was one of your ex-students, I think. So uh-huh. we'll we'll talk a little bit. I'll look that up in a minute. Uh later on this this season so well it's we'll a spectacular that. bird and yeah. uh, and a, a fun one that i've not had oh and i talked with you about my mockingbird who i call mirror bird <laughs> kevin you remember we've talked mm-hmm. about mirror bird we have not seen for we think a whole week now didn't you ask me about uh window collisions one time and i Mm-hmm. suggested he, maybe you get in touch with the cornell lab of ornithology mm-hmm. and i did read everything that they had to say uh-huh. Our fix was simply when I realized that he was going around the house just senselessly banging pretty hard, it was every window without a screen. Uh. So Paul put up four screens, and that stopped, and then he started the mirrors on the cars, Mm. and that was getting pretty wild. So I actually put up two small hand mirrors in trees close to where he would roost. Oh, good for you. And he has played with those mirrors. <laughs> it seems like he finally made friends with those images, and so he would he would peck on them but not, you know, fl- I was afraid he was going to be injured. He that or he's flailing. wasting a lot of time yep. uh, poking at himself. and yeah. But there was never another bird. Oh. We assumed that was a, a young male that came mm-hmm. in. And established his territory, and he has now gone, and I assume to find a mate. Well, yeah, or to find a place, yeah, where there were other other, other mockingbirds. mockingbirds. Yeah. So we've lost him, and now we're waiting for the male Phoebe, and waiting for everybody else. I heard that Perulas mm-hmm. uh, That's were a nice seen early along the coast. Well. Mm-hmm. So, and we we have Perulas every year, so we're hoping that they'll be here soon. I think so, our producer Java wanted to chime in. Well, yeah, I just wanted to say I I feel so privileged to um, uh, uh, share my observations because I have them to share. (laughs) I know what I'm looking at. I saw a a beautiful, beautiful uh, cardinal just the other day in my in my backyard, nice and red, sitting on the fence. But also I have been noticing coming up here to MPB uh, Think Radio, the robins are out and they are big and fat. I don't know if this is just a great habitat or a great time or if it's maybe a bunch of males uh because they are I just noticed they are they are large. Well, <laughs> and they're right outside the uh the studio door. Exactly. Uh, so, when my, when uh, my granddaughter and I, Marley Kate, uh drove up this morning, there were several, maybe 10 or so. Yes, sir. Robins foraging on the the grass, and uh, that's a wonderful bird that uh, breeds around here, but most of the birds are going to head north pretty soon. So, um, Most of the, of the robins, robins yeah. Robins, right. They're, um, they're our winter bird, Java. So, um, but this time of year, birds have a, will have a molt, end of winter, and they're just looking great for spring. They are. So that's what you're seeing on your robins. And whether or not they'll stay here and find a a maiden nest or whether they'll go somewhere else, that's what they're getting ready for. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. As usual, Dr. Troy Major joining us from his clinic in Jackson. Uh, Dr. Major, let me mention the pollen, and I know that humans uh, suffer with uh, allergies uh, this time of year, primarily due to a lot of the pollen. What about allergies uh, from pollen in our pets? We see a lot of that. and a lot of it has to do with uh, feet. Uh, dogs, especially out, you know, in the yard, they're right with all the down with all that, and they we see a lot of licking of the feet, chewing on the feet, and I think it's influenced by pollen and, uh, of course, some allergies to to certain types of grass as well. But uh, as far as the upper respiratory part that 
people have. We don't see as much of that. We do see some eyes that uh, I think are directly related to to pollen and allergies, uh, but usually it's nothing severe. So, what would be a symptom uh, of a pet that this, uh, that might thinks uh, you know that they might be suffering from an allergy and a trip to the vet? You know, the eye thing again. If an eye is excessively watering, if the animal is uh, scratching or rubbing it, uh, certainly that would uh, be something that you would think would need to go to the vet. Uh, and maybe some increased paritis or itching uh, related to that. Of course, we get into flea season, strong flea season, and we've seen a lot of multiplication or it's almost exponential when they start the fleas. And we're seeing some ticks. Of course, ticks are year-round here in Mississippi, uh, fleas as well, but they seem to proliferate more uh, in the springtime like everything else. This is Creature Comforts. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major and Libby Hartfield. We'll go to the phone lines and invite John in from Madison. Good morning, John. You're on the air with us. Uh, good morning. I have two quick questions. Uh, we finally got an eastern bluebird in our yard, and I think we have a pair. Uh, I think we have a female as well. But my question was, we have a little birdhouse that I bought as a bluebird house that we mounted a couple of years ago. But that hole looks a lot smaller than that bluebird does. And I was wondering if uh, I haven't seen them going in and out of that birdhouse, but is, can they get in that little hole or is he it, is nesting somewhere else? I'll let Libby comment on that since she has a string of bluebird boxes. Well, um, I'm not the greatest expert, but I'll tell you exactly what I would do. I would get on the Merlin app or really anywhere, I guess, online, you could just Google and ask for the the size of opening for a bluebird and measure yours and be sure that it is the recommended size. If, if the hole is too big, and it is a kind of a tight fit, because if the hole is too big, you're going to get box parasites in there, and you still could. You know, you can get... Um, Snakes and things are not going to worry about what size of hole it is, but at least you'll keep out any predatory birds that want to go in there and get the eggs, which happens. All those things we don't like to talk about in the bird community. The pretty little birds will sometimes um, prey on each other's nests, and so it's it, it 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 cuts down a lot of that problem if the size is small. But that said, you don't want too small. Sometimes decorative boxes, and I like those too. I have plenty of them and uh, sometimes they're not made to the very best specifications for each species of bird and a lot of birders are really strict about that in their yard and will only have bird boxes that are made you know to I guess their scientific so you live in a suburban area residential in Madison and was just wondering if there might be other birds that uh are, there are many other hole nesters that might try to co-op your bird yeah. box. If that's not a good box for your bluebird, you can get a bluebird box that you know that'll be exactly right, and then you can move that somewhere else, and that would be great for um, Carolina wrens or chickadees, chickadees or so. tufted titmice. Those three will love. They love cavities, and they're they're tiny enough that they'll get in something that a bluebird can't even get in. Well, he's obviously nesting somewhere. I mean, he's been here for two or three weeks, and uh, and actually, he's been banging on our windows. And I was I was glad to hear your comments earlier about what to do about that. But so he's obviously nesting somewhere. Um, so a, a box, if he's not using that box, then then really a box isn't all that necessary. Um, not not always, you know. Bluebirds did fine before people came along and before we did boxes, but there were more big old trees with cavities. That's one of the reasons that so many of us put out nesting boxes now is because there used to be lots of big old trees in the woods, and, you know, we we're just... We manage our our forests differently now, so that we tend to not have trees that have knot holes in them. And what a bluebird prefers is a big old tree standing, I guess, in kind of an open prairie type of a situation. And there's some water close by, and they can freely fly um, in the open to catch insects. 
So they're looking for that, and we mimic that by putting up a string of bird boxes in, in just the right area, then they won't be so dependent on those old tree snags. And uh, okay. pro producer Java Chapman tells us that one and a half inches is the recommended uh, diameter for the bluebird boxes. Thanks, Java. Yeah. Well, I actually have to give okay. that to um, uh, one of our faithful listeners, Charlie. <laughs> he texts me in uh, one and a half inches. Thanks, so thanks Charlie. Thanks, Charlie. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm, we know it's Charlie that he is. Yeah. My second question, real quick, is when should I put, start putting out hummingbird feeders? Oh, um, I'm going to put mine up this week. I usually do it right around the Ides of March is usually when I do it. And we've heard a couple of friends talk about having bluebirds on the coast. So they're they're heading north. Yeah, you could. Okay. I was just going to say that a lot of people wonder if they should take their blue uh, hummingbird feeders up and down. And there's actually some debate about whether it's necessary, but most people do. We do. Uh, Libby does. And then put them back up. And, uh, yeah. and right now what I'm checking is my red buckeye. That's, ah. I think that's more important than the feeders for my yard. So if, if they come to the red buckeye, because it's blooming now. Yeah, that's the thing to do with yeah. your, if you have a landscape that accommodates uh, flowers and shrubs that flower, that's ideal for hummingbirds. All right, John, thanks for your call this morning. Let's stay on the phone lines. We'll go to Raymond next. Jesse has called in today. Good morning, Jesse. You're on the air. Yeah, I was watching a movie the other day. It's called The Big Year. It's real funny. It's about these professional bird watchers. And, and they talked about something called a fallout. It's, I mean, I mean, they were rushing to get to these fallouts. And, and as I understand it, I actually don't know what it is. Are, do you know what this is? <laughs> yes, a fallout is an expression for when the weather um, is such that it drops, if you will, a lot of migratory birds out of the atmosphere. Who They land um, in some woodlot or some other uh, landscape, and this is especially prominent along the northern coast of the Gulf of Mexico. Louisiana, for example, have um, stretches of woodland habitat called chenilles that lie right along the coast. And if the weather is right, uh, stormy weather, winds that are unfavorable, migratory birds that are crossing the Gulf of Mexico will land by the hundreds, if not more, in these small woodlots, and they're called fallouts. And it's a uh, for a bird watcher, it's like Mecca. It's, it's uh, just a remarkable experience for the diversity of migratory birds you can see. And you can, can predict... in the fall? In you, the you, fall? Well, in the fall, yes. You'll see um, weather will force birds down um, into woodlots, especially along the coast where there's isolated woodlands. Um, in a landscape that's largely developed. But spring, they're probably more prominent um, just because birds have crossed the Gulf of Mexico and this is the first land they encounter. And if they encounter uh, unfavorable weather, you know, even just an afternoon storm, they set them down and um, you have a chance to watch them. It's quite remarkable. And you can, per you can predict these events too if you pay attention to the weather you'll know that it's likely there'll be a fallout of migratory birds in spring, especially. Thank you so much. All right, uh, Jesse, thanks for your call. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. If you want to join the conversation today, you can always send us an email to animals at mpbonline.org. Uh, so, Frank, if you would tell us a little bit about your background and how you chose to focus uh, studying migratory birds. Ah. As a graduate student, I started research, uh, of all places, in northern Michigan on Lake Huron with uh, ring-billed and herring gulls. They're migratory, and that was where my interest started with migrants. But it really wasn't until I moved, Cindy and I moved to uh, South, Carolina, uh, South Mississippi that I started to take advantage of uh, the opportunity to study migratory birds along the coast which is just a phenomenal uh, place to engage migratory birds both spring and fall. So I imagine you've studied migratory birds for a long time. Are, are there still things that surprise you about these birds? Uh, yes. Uh, I was thinking about this before the, uh, 
or coming up to Jackson for the show, thinking about uh, when do migratory birds sleep, for example. I mean, most of the birds um, that visit Libby's um, property are day migrants. They sleep at night, just like you and I. But during migration, they're nighttime movers. They migrate at night. So do they lose sleep? And what are the consequences of losing sleep? And it's a really understudied uh, phenomenon, for, for example. So uh, back to the basics, tell us exactly what is migration and, and why do so many species of birds seem to undertake migration? Migration is largely um, t- um, linked to seasonal changes. So in North America, in temperate North America, we, we know what happens during the winter. Uh, food resources are depressed. Uh, the weather climate becomes tougher, if you will. And so many birds will move south to better climes to um, spend a North American winter. Now, many of these birds, uh, to be honest, are evolutionarily, historically, uh, southern birds, tropical birds, that in effect invaded or moved north to take advantage of the temperate summer when there's a rich influx of food, uh, opportunities to breed are rich, the weather's great, and um, so they take advantage of that. And then, you know, in fall, they return to their tropical home, if you will. So um, it's, an in, it's innate behavior. I mean, no one has to teach a bird how or why to migrate, I guess. No, but they can learn um, to respond to uh, events or um, take advantage of opportunities that might arise. But you're right. It's an innate phenomenon, endogenously programmed, if you will. And I think from discussions we've had on the show before, it's it's not an exact same route, you know, every time they do it. They, they can and do adapt to weather conditions and, and that sort of thing. That's true. And I suppose that's most true for songbirds, small migratory birds that uh, will return to your backyard to breed so they know where they're going. But they can get there in a variety of ways, if you will, routes. Whereas there are other birds, uh, shorebirds, for example, waterfowl, that take advantage of um, situations en route that become particularly important, uh, mud flats or um, w- reservoirs where, that are suitable for um, migration. And so they're pretty precise about their migratory route. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Levy Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. Today, our guest for the hour is Dr. Frank Moore from the University of Southern Mississippi. If you missed any of today's show, you can subscribe to our podcast using your favorite podcasting app, or if you download the MPB Public Media app for your smartphone, you can listen to all the local MPB Think Radio programs on your schedule. So to join our conversation this morning, you can always email animals at mpbonline.org. Let's go back to the phones. Uh, James has called in from Gulfport this morning. Go ahead, James. You're on the air with us. Yes. Um, My mama cat had kittens this morning, and um, the the first two came out very quietly, and they were all right. And then she passed another two, and one of them was much larger than the others and was dead. Then she has, she's having several more come out, but they're still attached to her by the uh, placenta. And I wonder, I can't get them free of the mama because w- without cutting that placenta, what am I supposed to do? Do I take a pair of scissors and clip it and, and free them? Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of distressed. I'm <laughs> Dr. Major? I don't, I don't. Yes, I understand why it can be stressful. My, my thing would be to, if you have gloves uh, or, or can take paper towel and gently pull not on the kittens, but reach and pull where they where it's attached to the placenta that's still in the in the cat. Uh, that would, I think, probably pull that on out. Now, you may at that point, after you get them out, need to... Uh, detach the um, 
umbilical the cord that's attached to the placenta, you may probably go on and uh, cut that, and you can use uh, uh, thread or something to put a to keep it from bleeding. We see sometimes where uh, a whole litter of kittens will be tangled up in placenta, and uh, it's like a just amazing how it can happen. They can get tangled up. But see what you can do as far as gentle pressure. If you can't get those kittens on out or the placenta on out, you probably need to take her into the vet. I think you can do this, though. Just, uh, again, put gentle pressure uh, and pull that placenta out if you can or placenta. Okay? Um, okay. Okay. Uh... I'm, well, in Tom's case, she's lying right here in front of me in this condition, and right. uh, I, I don't want to hurt the mama you have, cat. That, and you have two I, kittens. I think that, that, you have two but kittens I can't that leave are out, but still attached to the son of right. Yeah. So that if 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 I don't succeed in in getting the placenta to slip on out, um, what do I do? Well, that's what I'm saying. If you can't do that, I'd say take her to your vet and, and let them take care of that. Just, you know, make yeah. her comfortable and with the kittens. But I think you can do this. I mean, I really believe you okay. can help uh, help get that placenta on out just by gentle traction, okay? Uh, yeah. We can give you uh, my number. I'll be glad to talk to you. Uh, Kevin, Can you can uh, relay that back to Java with Kevin your number, and I can give you a call a little bit later, okay? Oh, uh, yeah, I can give you my, my number. I, don't, I, I have a phone in one hand, and I have a cat in the other. I don't have anything to write a number down, but my telephone number in, in Gulfport is 228. We'll make sure that uh, we give that to Dr. Major after the show, and he can call you and give you some further advice. Uh, good luck with that. I I. I, I, I I hear your stress and understand what you're going through. So hopefully uh, when after the show is over, Dr. Major will be able to give you some help. But we certainly appreciate your call. And thanks for listening uh, to Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Got another caller on the line. So let's uh, move next uh, to Jerry, who's called in from Rankin County. Good morning, Jerry. You're on the air. Go ahead. I have a question, I guess, of about the Canadian goose that has lost its ability to migrate here in central Mississippi and possibly other places in the south and this seems to have taken place over the last 25 or 30 years and I was wondering and hoping at the same time that there was some way that they would regain that ability and they wouldn't become you know become less of a nuisance than they seem to be now and I'll just listen to that response to that. Yeah, that's a, a, a widespread problem. I guess some would regard it as a problem, and I understand uh, my brother who lives in the Chicago area ha- experiences the same issue on some property. They have um, ge- geese are simply not moving or they're spending more time uh, around areas that uh, are highly populated or otherwise we don't want to experience geese. And uh, same thing's happening to us. We uh, live on some lakes uh, in near Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and geese are present uh, almost year-round. Whereas historically, of course, as you pointed out, um, geese are uh, quite migratory. And in many parts of their range, they remain migratory. All right, uh, Jerry, go Go ahead. Yeah, but I'm not, my, my real question, scientifically, I guess, or a scientific answer: Is there any hope that they would, you know, these that used to be migratory would become migratory again, or is that just a lost cause? Well, I think some of this could be highly facultative. You know, it's, in other words, they're just simply taking advantage of an opportunity, and if that opportunity disappears, the habitat, uh, the the inviting circumstances, then they're likely to to move again and uh, how far or to what extent. Now, whether they regain uh, historical migration routes, that's probably unlikely, Um, at least certainly not in your lifetime or my lifetime. Yeah, there's still populations of the geese that do migrate, Mm -hmm. as always. And now, I want to say that there's some of these have been raised they've been kind of genetically engineered to 
well, maybe engineering is wrong, but they've been mm. um, bred to um, not migrate. There's been some encouragement through the years of that. You might e- express your concern to the Department of Wildlife and see what they have to say about it, because I know they've been um, taking some measures with these geese that don't migrate. Or they to- were brought into the state years ago. Thanks for your call this morning, Jerry. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. We're visiting today uh, with Dr. Frank Moore from the University of Southern Mississippi talking about bird migration. Uh, so, Frank, why is the northern coast of the Gulf of Mexico so important to bird migration? Well, when you think about fall migration or spring, as we're about to be engaged in spring migration, it's already underway, uh, Many, much of our bird life spent the temperate winter in the tropics, Mexico, Central America, South America. And so they fly across the Gulf of Mexico and the first suitable land they encounter is the Gulf Coast. And uh, now many of these birds are quite capable of continuing to fly many miles inland. In other words, this is not a um, terribly difficult chore that is to fly across the Gulf of Mexico if You've uh, made sure you carry enough fuel, and you take advantage of favorable weather. And migratory birds, bird like birds in general, are quite good meteorologists. They know when a front is coming and or when the circumstances are changing that allow them to uh, take advantage of following winds, for example. So is that why weather radar can help us learn more about bird migration? Absolutely. In fact, I'd encourage um, viewers to take advantage of weather surveillance radar. Uh, There are sites you can find uh, by searching the Internet, uh, weather radar and migratory birds, and several uh, sites will come up that allow you to actually watch uh, migration in real time. Uh, that is to say, uh, weather surveillance radar that brings you the weather that we're experiencing now, it's chilly, cool, um, is able to pick up or detect migratory birds, uh, shorebirds, waterfowl, songbirds, as well as insects. And, um, and that is a rich uh, tool, if you will, to study or to simply enjoy bird migration. You're listening to Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major and Libby Hartfield and our guest for this hour, Dr. Frank Moore, Professor Emeritus at the University of Southern Mississippi. We're talking about bird migration today and if you want to join the conversation, you can always email the show by sending it to animals at mpbonline.org. Our friend Mikey is on the line this morning from Mobile. Uh, Mikey, you're on the air with us. Go ahead. Hey, thank you. Um, uh with the supposed magnetic core of the earth and the birds being some, I mean, and I certainly ain't no bird expert, y'all, as y'all can tell by my question here, but, uh, but I wonder about these things. Um, uh, earthquakes, first of all, of course, the, the core of the planet shifting in those areas would have to change the magnetic field. The other question is um, the magnetosphere where the planets reach into each other. Um, uh, how much does that influence the the way that birds do things? Well, you know, actually, that's an excellent question because birds, migratory birds of all sizes and shapes, have a magnetic compass, and they use it to determine direction. It also is used to help them uh, find their home, if you will. And, yes, if, if you're aware that this, uh, their solar activity for example, will periodically disturb the Earth's magnetic field. And so we often wonder, well, if that disturbance, does it throw the birds off? Do they uh, fly in the wrong direction? And in fact, it can disrupt their orientation, but they're pretty, what do you say, malleable. They're easily uh, adjust to circumstances. So yes, that can disturb a bird's orientation, you know, a navigation. Um, but they're short-lived phenomena. But earth, so earthquakes then, uh, you know, coming from the other end of, of the spectrum, you know, from inside the planet, um, how about that? 
Well, I can't speak with any authority about the effect of earthquakes on the Earth's magnetic field. I suspect it would be a momentary or a short-term uh, change that could disrupt uh, animal activity, birds and other critters. Um, I think we're, uh, if we think about the Earth's magnetic field shifting, um, actually changing, <laughs> for, you know, over time, that too um, could could affect uh, the behavior of animals. Well, particularly since there are so many reports of animals behaving differently right before those sorts of things, those events. Well, I, there's no question that uh, animals and general birds can determine or, or pick up on uh, perceive changes, subtle changes in the environment. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, birds are quite good meteorologists, so they can detect barometric pressure changes up and down, which predict uh, coming fronts. For example, the one we're experiencing a uh, sh- few days ago that arrived. Uh, birds are well aware of these um, meteorological events. More than we are. <laughs> that that's, might well be true. Thank you so much. I appreciate you answering. All right, Mikey, good to hear from you this morning. Thanks for the call. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. We're visiting today with Frank Moore from the University of Southern Mississippi and talking about bird migration. So, Frank, you've got a big group of birds kind of flying together, uh, you know, from point A to point B. Excuse the pun, but what's the pecking order? How do they determine who is the lead bird, and does he sometimes get some time off and to the back of the pack? Uh-huh. Well, if, depending on the species or size of birds, if we think about waterfowl, for example, uh, or ge- we were talking about geese a short time ago, that often fly in uh, more or less in formation, that aerodynamically, these um, formations can make a difference as to where you are in the group. And birds will often change position, if you will, uh, to take advantage of favorable uh, winds. Or, or lack of turbulence, if you will. Now, many other birds are simply in loose flocks. Uh, robins, for example, that spend a lot of time in flocks will move in flocks. And what's the advantage or disadvantage of being in a flock? I mean, you think of being able to find food more easily or avoid predators or uh, what have you, or attract predators, you know, if it's a large group of birds. But, uh, so flocking or group movement is an interesting question to, to address. So um, talk about some of the birds that call uh, the Mississippi coast home for part of the year. Well, I suppose much of the bird life on the uh, Mississippi coast is there uh, seasonally. And that's true whether we're talking about marsh birds or woodland birds or grassland birds. Um, although in South Mississippi, uh, there are many species of birds that in Ohio or Michigan are migratory. They aren't by us. So they spend the entire winter uh, or the entire year in uh, the Mobile area or Gulfport or Louisiana coast. Um, so we talked about uh, the importance of the coast in migration. Uh, first, tell us what is a wet pine savanna and how does it play a role in migration? Wet pine savanna, well, if I suppose that's going to depend upon the, the species of birds we're interested in. Um, certainly marsh birds or waterfowl, depending upon how open the habitat is. Um, we think about songbirds like prothonotary warblers that depend upon wetlands, if you will, uh, vegetated wooded wetlands. Um, so, it, it, as I say, it really depends on uh, the bird we have in mind. But it would almost be like an oasis. It's an area that they obviously could benefit from on, on their long journey, I guess. Uh, I, if, if the um, food is there and uh, shelter and, and pine savannas might not be very attractive to, say, uh, birds that are used to hardwood habitat or marshes. Uh, so... Again, that's going to be species-specific, I guess you'd say. We've got another phone call on the line, so this time we're going to say good morning to Mike calling in from Natchez. Good morning, Mike. You're on the air. 
Good morning, uh, enjoy your program. Thank you. Uh, we live in downtown Masters. In, in our backyard, our patio, we have a holly tree. Uh, a holly tree, and every year about this time, mainly on President's Day, the waxwing cedars come. Cedar waxwings come, and they attack that tree, and they strip it bare within five minutes, and they fly away. Where are they? Where are they coming from? Ah, they're cedar waxwings as well as bohemian waxwings, the larger um, bird that looks very much like a cedar waxwing, are, let's call them nomadic, and they move around. Actually, there's probably more organization to their movements than we imagine, but they'll move from area to area to take advantage, for example, of your holly tree. And what's very interesting is, my guess is you also have mockingbirds in the that feed on the holly berries. Oh yeah, we, yeah, we, we have a popular mockingbird that, that, that sits in, in, in a chimney and fights everybody away from from a fig tree. Yes, and that's <laughs> that's the real challenge. If I'm a mockingbird, <laughs> is how do I protect my uh, fruit when I'm being inundated yeah. by cedar waxwings? And it's next to impossible. Yeah, yeah, yeah to do. Well, well the, the mockingbird and I have have an agreement. He takes the top part of the fig tree, we take the bottom part of the fig tree. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, that's the way we are, work. too, yes. <laughs> that's good. But those cedar waxwings are predictable, as you just said, uh, in their movements. I mean, they arrive in your area yeah, a certain every, time. Every year at this time. And then they move on yeah, to yeah. another area. So, uh, so I, I hesitate to say they're nomadic, but they certainly move around a lot in large groups. Beautiful right. bird. Beautiful bird. They've been on our holly bushes fairly recently, mm -hmm. and I think they come by. I don't know. Maybe it's different little groups of nomads, but the, I see cedar waxwings checking out our mulberry trees already. It'll probably be another month before they're really loaded, but they'll come and stay for days when the um, mulberries are in season. And that just That just points out to all of us how... Um, birds time their activities both daily as well as seasonally on um, events in the environment like when fruit uh, is set in trees. Yeah. You'll find birds there. In our Orioles particularly. There you go. We, um, we had Orioles, we had a house fire it's been 23 years ago now, and our mulberry tree burned to the ground. It was a big, huge mulberry tree. And every year, like clockwork, when the mulberries came in, the Orioles showed up. And the Orioles came two years after the fire and left both times and then didn't come back for years. And we replanted mulberries, and they are now back. Oh, that's a so wonderful story. So I guess story. they kept catching. You yes. know, every now and then they'd check to ever see, I suppose. Or maybe it was just fortuitous that one happened by, and it's like, okay, now they found us. And they'll compete pretty well. It's amazing how well they get right in there with the cedar wax wings. And, uh, right. But that's and, – and you're we're talking about Orioles, so they're long-distance migrants. Yeah. And yet they still time their appearance and disappearance and movement uh, in space and time quite well. Thanks for your call, Mike. Uh, Frank, got about a minute left here. Uh, if folks are trying to find out more about migration and migratory birds, especially those that come through Mississippi, is uh, maybe someplace online that's a good resource? Well, I've suggested to folks that the Cornell Lab or Laboratory of Ornithology, uh, you can easily find that on the Internet. You can join the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, but, you, but much of their information is free. And it's rich, rich uh, source of information. Very, um, and and also for young people, like even my granddaughter who's eight, could take advantage of some of the resources at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Yeah, I've been to that website a couple of times as well. It's chock full of bird information. That's going to wrap us up for today. Creature Comforts is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio, funding provided in part by listeners. To hear today's show or a previous show, you can visit Creature Comforts dot mpb online dot org our show is produced by java chapman and our call screener today was jermaine flood who is also our podcast producer so for dr troy major libby hartfield and our guest frank moore i'm kevin farrell we'll be back next thursday at nine for another creature comforts it's heard only on mpb think radio this is an mpb think radio podcast 
To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.